Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2012 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present our very own Dr. Takuya Konishi. Takuya is a postdoctoral fellow here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Takuya began his undergraduate studies at the Kochi University in Japan, but after his first year, he transferred to the University of Alberta, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in Earth Sciences and Biological Sciences. He stayed at the U of A to pursue his PhD in biolog Biological Sciences, where he studied the systematics of plioplaticarpine mosasaurs. Finally, in September 2009, Takuya joined the Royal Tyrrell Museum as a postdoctoral fellow. Takuya's research interests revolve around the evolution of mosasaurs, a group of extinct marine lizards that reached a worldwide distribution during the Cretaceous. As such, Takuya's research has taken him to museums all over the world, including, including those in Canada, the United States, France, Belgium, England, the Netherlands, and Japan. Today, Takuya will describe a previously unknown feeding style in the 75 million year old mosasaur Prognathodon. This discovery is based on two exquisite specimens, one of which is on display here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum, that were found by mining crews at the Korite Mine south of Lethbridge during a routine excavation for the semi-precious stone amylite. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Takuya Konishi. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? No, oh, Dave, okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for coming uh, uh, for this talk, to this talk uh, entitled Systematics and Paleoecology of Prognathodon, uh, which is a mosasaur from the Beapa Sea of Alberta. And uh, uh, those words that are probably un unfamiliar to many of you uh, will be explained hopefully in the uh, uh, few slides later. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a, a new picture uh, that I found on, on, on website. This is done by Karen Carr and uh, uh, showing conveniently what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is the uh, predation of a turtle by a large mosasaur. So, and uh, uh, I'll just go uh, from here. First of all, mosasaurs, uh, as much as uh, people like to admire them as dinosaurs, they are not dinosaurs, as Francois said, they are just big marine lizards. And uh, one of the things that, this is a skull of a mosasaur called Clydastis. Here's the uh, eye socket. And uh, if, uh, to make mosasaur a dinosaur, you have to have another opening in front of the eye, which is lacking in this case. So uh, that really means that mosasaurs are not dinosaurs. After all, dinosaurs did not live in the sea uh, throughout their evolution as much as we know. And so uh, it uh, all makes sense that uh, we are talking about something that are not dinosaurs. And uh, hopefully that uh, doesn't discourage you to uh, keep watching my show today. <laughs> and you, okay, you should stay. All right, so uh, mosasaurs, this diagram is, uh, is a very, very uh, uh, brief summary of uh, the diversity and interrelationships within mosasaurs. We know that there are four uh, major groups, uh, Mosasaurinae here, including Prognathodon, Tidosaurinae, uh, these uh, the big ones here uh, on the other side of the uh, evolutionary tree, Plyoplaticarpinae, and Halosaurines. And uh, uh, you don't have to worry about those four names, uh, really, except for Mosasaurinae. Uh, but I want you to know that there are nearly 70 species of Mosasaurs known uh, today uh, within 30 genera. And within that uh, 70 species, there are more than 50% uh, 50, more than 50 of that species are indeed uh, uh, mosasaurian mosasaurs. So those numbers on the uh, red box, nearby the red boxes, uh, represent the number of the genera. And I said that there are about 30 genera of mosasaurs and indeed 50% uh, or so uh, uh, is uh, uh, consumed or not consumed, composed of mosasaurines. And uh, uh, that the skull I showed you first, uh, Clydastis, is one of the more primitive members of mosasaurines. And Prognathodon is a little bit more derived uh, 
advanced, uh, if you will, uh, within the Mosasaurine. And uh, uh, throughout my talk today, I would focus mainly on Mosasaurine mosasaurs, including Prognathodon. So let's uh, begin. First of all, um, in my first title slide, it said Alberta, and, uh, uh, which means and we are talking about marine reptiles. So that have to mean that Alberta was once upon a time under the sea. And uh, this is how North America looked like 75 million years ago. And uh, you can see very well, clearly, that, well, most of the Saskatchewan is underwater, but so is uh, Alberta. And uh, that seaway connecting Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico or is uh, termed Western Interior Seaway. Now, uh, there's a term Bearpaw Sea in my title slide, and uh, that Bearpaw Sea specifically refers to this interior, Western Interior Seaway in, during this time period, about 75 million years ago. And uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, a nickname, uh, if you will, for Western Interior Seaway around this time period, okay? Now, the sea uh, back then, during the late Cretaceous, looked very different. Uh, aside from some things like sea turtles that are still present today, there are so many other uh, diverse uh, array of uh, marine reptiles. Starting from here, this is a long-necked plesiosaur, Elasmosaurus, uh, specifically a Styxosaurus from, uh, uh, that were swimming in, this, uh, in Alberta, uh, if you came to, uh, um, uh, well, uh, no, no. If, uh, if you know that we are going to, uh, we, we do ha have uh, this group of marine reptiles from Alberta as well. And uh, uh, of course, mosasaurs and sea turtles still around, sharks, of course, and uh, sometimes eating on mosasaurs and vice versa. A big fish, a Xyphactinus, a five meter long fish uh, that uh, were highly predaceous and uh, ate big, other big fish whole, swallowed them whole. Uh, this is a, uh, just in the sky, there are no, well, not, not many birds known, but rather we had pterosaurs uh, flying uh, freely. And so it's a very dynamic, uh, different but dynamic uh, setting in the uh, Cretaceous Sea. So uh, uh, just to uh, give you some idea about uh, geological background, this is called geologic map of uh, map, and this is showing what kind of rocks are exposed on the surface when you um, uh, in Alberta, and uh, we know that this uh, this is the uh, lower uh, right hand corner. This uh, gray area is the Bearpaw Formation, the rock containing the uh, uh, prognathodon that I'm going to go to talk about today. Here's Edmonton. Now, this area looks very similar in color to Bearpo, but this is not a Bearpo formation. Uh, instead, here you see the strip of uh, lighter green color, uh, and that's uh, also marine clear water formation. But those formations, then this is where uh, uh, last week's Don's ankylosaur came from, which uh, was living much, much, uh, be, uh, much older, about 130 million years ago, uh, than the Mosasaurus that I'm going to talk today. 75 million years ago, it was still within the Cretaceous. And uh, uh, about 10 million years later, the Cretaceous ends, uh, along with the extinction of all the dinosaurs and mosasaurs and other marine, uh, marine reptiles, minus turtles. And that's the, where the uh, uh, specific locality of the today's uh, specimen, that's just south of Lethbridge. And you can see this spot is within this Bearpaw formation exposure, or exposed on the surface. Okay. Now, uh, this is, uh, uh, the, the, there are two specimens ca uh, that uh, were excavated, and uh, they both came from uh, this uh, bank of uh, St. Mary River. This is uh, the mining site for ammonite, the gem quality ammonite. You, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, you've seen it, uh, having lived in Alberta for uh, some time. Uh, and uh, uh, it was lucky for us because there was a big operating machines like that that could uh, help us uh, lift this big block containing a mosasaur. With respect to the uh, uh, age, uh, we know that uh, the mosasaurs, the two mosasaurs came from this horizon just uh, uh, about uh, uh, 50 meters or so above the base of the Bearpaw Formation in Lethbridge. And uh, uh, based on the, the time that we know uh, sandwiching this horizon, 
the mosasaurs uh, were probably about 75 million years old, uh, specifically, more specifically 74.8 million years ago. Okay, this is the first specimen and, uh, of the prognathodon. And the prognathodon, you can see uh, the head is rather massive. This is eye socket. Uh, the snout is here. This is the neck region, uh, the shoulder girdle here, and the trunk. And this is a hip, and then the tail. Uh, it's missing flippers, unfortunately, but the next one would have it. Uh, something that was quite uh, lucky uh, or uh, significant about this specimen, not only it was a beautiful specimen, exquisite specimen, it had something that were not mosasaur and uh, uh, that can be interpreted as gut contents. Let's magnify that area. Everything that I circled in yellow circles, they are not the part of the mosasaur, but rather belong to different animals. So it's natural to think that they, are, they were something that the, the mosasaur ate uh, as its last meal, so to speak. And I'm going to go uh, uh, into more details in the, in the later slides. A second specimen here is uh, also an uh, exquisite specimen. It's got skull, uh, the, most of the skeleton. And then on top of the, uh, uh, the, that, we, it, we have the flipper. Uh, it's particularly the right flipper uh, in, the, in the back flipper is very well preserved, uh, just only missing the distal ends of the finger po fingers. But otherwise, you can see that this is not a conventional limb that uh, your, your puppy or cats have, but rather it is a flipper. So you can see, although this is a, a big lizard, yes, it is. However, the, the limbs of the lizards evolved into flippers, um, of course, obviously, to better adapt to life in water. OK, uh, for the first specimen, I would like to focus on the skull. And uh, because the skull of this particular spec this specimen is particularly well preserved, this is the interpretive drawing of that skull. What I want you to focus most today is the dentition or the tooth morphology. Let's have a look at the tip of the jaw where the teeth are rather pokey, slender, and straight. Now, it uh, actually, sorry, recur recurved a little bit, curved a little bit, but then towards the middle, the teeth start becoming more bulge and, uh, bulged and uh, ro robust, straighter. Towards the back, though, that uh, uh, tooth uh, again starts curving posteriorly and it becomes shorter, but still stout, not slender like the front teeth. Right here, uh, where I have the uh, P5 here, letter here, those teeth are different from the teeth on the jaws. These teeth are on the roof of the mouth of the, uh, the mosasaur called uh, pterygoid teeth. And uh, those pterygoid teeth uh, are, uh, so that's additional to the, the, what we call uh, mar marginal teeth that were on the jaws. So not only mosasaurs had teeth like us, but also it also has some additional teeth on the, on the roof of the mouth. And uh, what were they? Four. Well, let's have a look. So the, uh, uh, when you look at the middle part of the jaw, where the teeth are really uh, bulbous, that bulbousness seems to, have been, uh, seems to be all actually accentuated by the fact that those teeth uh, that are rather robust um, have really worn out tips. Okay? This is uh, uh, number eight, number 10 on this upper jaw. This is number 10, number 12 on the lower jaw. But in, in both cases, you see the constant uh, similar degree of wear on the tips of the teeth. So that really certainly makes the tooth look like um, uh, more um, round or bulbous. And you can see that that's not the case when you look at the tooth that is still coming out, erupting, because uh, the, uh, the tip is still sharp and it's not flat like other ones that are fully erupted. Now, uh, right here, I like to introduce you some terminology. You might wonder that uh, uh, this mosasaur is still growing because the tooth, new tooth is coming out. Well, that's not likely. This is rather big individual. The f uh, bones are fused, etc. So I think this is a, a more or less mature individual. Why then still new teeth? Well, reptiles uh, are known to have the condition called polyphyodonty. That means that the teeth are constantly shed and regrown throughout the life of the reptiles versus uh, 
Diphyodonty, which is us, mammals, including us, only have one time of replacement, correct? I, I, I am. I only have one replacement teeth. I hope you are the same thing, right? <laughs> okay. And so, uh, but anyway, mosasaurs being reptiles, uh, being lizards, being reptiles, they have constantly re renewed, replaced their teeth. And that's, the, that's why it's convenient for me, for example, to show, to show the difference between the erupted teeth and the erupting teeth. So that really tells me that the teeth that were erupted were in constant contact with something hard. Uh, something hard enough uh, that it has to it had to wear its apex or apices of the teeth, and so those teeth must have been processing something hard as a prey item. In contrast, when you look at these uh, the teeth from the roof of the mouth of the mosasaur, whether it's erupting like that or whether it's fully erupted, none of those teeth have wearing facet. So those teeth must have. Uh, most likely did not play uh, a role in processing the food, but rather just uh, hanging there in case a chunk of food uh, that is going through the throat, uh, you know, um, goes backwards to uh, back to the uh, um, out out of the mouth. Then it that that gripped on the mouth uh, on the on the uh, prey items and made made sure ensured that all the food items processed in the mouth gets back into the throat. So this is some kind of uh, uh, that uh, preventing food items from reversing out into the, uh, uh, the water. And sure enough, what we found, one of the things that we found as part of the gut contents is the turtle. This part is uh, at the back end of the turtle skull, and this is the cheekbone of the turtle skull. Okay, right here. So right here sits the orbit or eye socket. So uh, no wonder the tooth has been heavily worn, uh, because it was chewing on something that has a hard shell like this. We didn't find any shell remains of the turtle with this mosasaur. However, based on the size of the head uh, elements, we could uh, estimate that this mosasaur ate the sea turtle that had two feet uh, shell across a diameter or 60 centimeters. So, um, uh, so during the Cretaceous, there's a uh, uh, little bit of... Uh, that's going on as well. Okay, uh, you'd better laugh. That, that was the only slide that I had a joke slide, okay? <laughs> so if you didn't, uh, you missed the opportunity. <laughs> At the same time, the tooth of the, this particular mosasaur also have this uh, well-defined edge, okay? That's a cutting edge. Now the cutting edge, when magnified, also shows this granular look. That's uh, cranulation, or uh, if you will, serration. But not as big a serration. But anyway, those bumpy, bumpy uh, feature is uh, uh, quite uh, conducive to slicing meat. And so not only it was crunching on turtles, but also it was slicing some kind of meat. And something else we, oh, by the way, this is a dinosaur tooth, a tyrannosaur tooth. And you, you can see the same feature, similar, similarity, the cutting edge equipped with those uh, bumps. So uh, something else that we found within the gut contents of this mosasaur is uh, really, uh, this is a two centimeter across vertebra from a big fish uh, called paratapon or paratapon-like fish. We don't know for sure it's, if it's paratapon or not, but the fish that looked very much and closely related to tarpon uh, that are living today. And uh, also we have uh, a probably rainbow trout sized fish as well. This vertebra, vertebra, fish vertebra, is only five millimeters across. But in any way, in any case, the mosasaur uh, consumed both these turtles and also those two uh, sea, uh, uh, fish. So it could slice the meat very well, as well as crunching on the something hard. Now, I like to introduce you now uh, to a little bit about ammonites because uh, of course this where the mosasaur was found are uh, the mining site for ammonite, gem quality ammonite. And so there are many, many, many more ammonite shells found than mosasaurs in that Lethbridge quarry. And uh, we ha this particular ammonite I think is Placentisaurus, a very smooth, uh, smooth shelled uh, ammonite with uh, well discoidal shell. So to be very good at swimming, 
And uh, uh, they are probably uh, e easily explained as chilled squids because they are related to squids and octopus, but only had a, a, a shell like that. Now, however, if you look uh, at the internal structure of the ammonite, the actual meat portion or the body of the ammonite occupies only that portion of the shell. The rest is mainly filled with gas for its control of the buoyancy within the water column. So if someone puncture this part of the shell, ammonite essentially lose that uh, sta sta stabilization within the water column and starts become, becoming wobbly and lose control and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, so that really made scientists to wonder uh, that uh, whatever uh, damage this portion of the shell would, were uh, hunting or preying on the, uh, on the ammonite. So I'd like to address that uh, a little later uh, from now. But at the same time, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce you to the, the lifestyle style of ammonites. They were predaceous. In fact, this ammonite is looking right at the fish. This, uh, this image came from National Geographic Sea Monsters video, and uh, maybe uh, 1.5 seconds after this, the, this fish gets eaten by this. Now, the fish gets eaten, uh, and ammonites do, uh, are able to do that because it has really a pair of jaws that are really sharp. The beak, that's where the beak is hidden. And if you uh, uh, know that uh, they were closely related to squids, you can see the squids, and here's a, a big humble squid with this uh, keratinous but very sharp and hard beaks. And that's what, and this is the uh, exp uh, without the flesh. But uh, uh, these, uh, these, because they are hard, they also get fossilized every now and then. And this is how the ammonite lower jaw looks like. And uh, here, uh, this is the ventral or underside view of the lower jaw. On the outer surface, we, uh, it's covered by very thin calcitic layer. If you strip that away, you get the two layers, outer laminae and inner laminae. Inner laminae. And inner laminae, uh, towards the apex, has this median ridge. And I think that our mosasaur has eaten and preserved this portion of the ammonite jaw. Let's have a look. Here's the gut contents, and that's the hip bone, and the ammonite jaw-like structure came from there. Have a look. This is a mosasaur rib, but if you look, this structure, there's an apex. It's bilaterally symmetrical, more or less. Uh, there's a concentric ridges, foldings, and then uh, this is an isolated element with uh, seemingly a natural edge. And uh, this edge uh, has a bevelled uh, feature, uh, su uh, structure to it. So that's probably a cutting, uh, kind of cutting edge, uh, it looks like to me. Let's have a look at this structure from the front end. Here, again, the apex, but now you can start seeing more details. For example, uh, here's some kind of midline ridge, uh, which could be midline ridge of inner lamina. Um, here's the uh, pitting going on, and inside this paired outer um, covering, covering is the uh, internal structure that could be in inner lamina uh, between outer laminae. So now, uh, not only the uh, morphology uh, looks uh, similar to that of ammonite jaw, but also upon uh, running some chemical analysis, uh, so this is checking the what kind of chemical uh, composition this material is um, made of, we can see that calcium is the highest, uh, has the co highest concentration. So that probably means that, uh, that uh, the, the, uh, there's that outermost layer, calcium uh, layer covering of this jaw like piece. So uh, I would conclude that, yes, uh, as long suspected, predation on more ammonite, in this particular case, placentisterous by prognathodon mosasaur, likely happened. And those holes that are really conspicuously uh, present on many of those ammonites from the, uh, from the mine of the ammonite uh, are uh, uh, nine chances out of ten made by some kind of preda predation behavior by the mosasaur. And as I said, once you puncture this uh, gas-filled chamber, the ammonite loses control of itself. So all what 
the predator needed to do is to take away the flesh part alone. So that's why uh, uh, it's most commonly found the, those, the ammonite shells with those punctures are most often most typically found without having the last chamber, that body containing chamber. So that's one other reason to speculate that predation was happening between mosasaurs and the ammonite. So with all that data in mind, we can now start speculating about what kind of uh, uh, feeding uh, habits or uh, food habits the mosasaur prognathodon had. This is the uh, figure uh, that uh, were that were present since 1987, and uh, someone did, uh, Judy Massari did the work uh, on the, uh, based on the tooth morphology and the gut contents of uh, extinct marine reptiles, she proposed these uh, figures, the triangle, where she plotted prey items from bony, soft, and hard, and uh, uh, depending on the tooth morphology, uh, she said that there's a, a range of uh, preferred food items consumed by marine predators. So have a look. We have large fish with this mosasaur. We have thin-shelled ammonoid. And we also have a sea turtle. In this case, because although sea turtle shells are much thicker than ammonite shell, because the shell itself is rather big, the relative thickness of the shell becomes rather thin. So it's, we are comf comfortable uh, by assigning sea turtles as part of this great uh, thin-shelled ammonoid or armored fish rather than hard clams such as uh, uh, you know, the thick-shelled ammonoid or clams. In, in, in any case, uh, that really gives us some idea about where this mosasaur was, uh, was in terms of this triangular um, uh, figure. And so that's where prognathodon obviously was. And as you can see, this uh, range of food, preferred food habits or food items was not previously expected in any marine reptiles, not just mosasaurs, but any other marine reptiles, including plesiosaurs and uh, ichthyosaurs, and so on, marine crocodiles alike. So uh, that is rather new. And uh, in fact, the mosasaur could have handled, well, prognathodon at least, could have handled way more than what uh, scientists pre pre predicted before. So that's really new. Let's move on to the second specimen now. And I would like to focus on the flippers, because that's the, uh, the this specimen preserves that very well, and the other one didn't. And flippers, uh, surprisingly, gave us some uh, uh, quite uh, uh, interesting results uh, when considering the evolution of mosasaurine mosasaurs uh, that uh, uh, I mentioned at the beginning to uh, talk about a little bit deeper today. So this is the four limb. Unfortunately, it lacks all the uh, finger uh, bones, but it is the upper arm bone, the uh, humerus, and then the uh, forearm bones here, and then this is uh, 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 the uh, wrist bone. Let's have a comparison with Clydastis, which is that, as I said, one of the more primitive members of Mosasauri mosasaurs. Surprisingly, although Prognathodon is supposed to be more advanced than uh, Clydastis, the shapes of between those two are very similar. Look at the uh, ulna, for example. It just looks identical. Look at the space, this round space called antibrachial foramen. It's also, also round. The humerus, uh, very, very similar. This, even that uh, radiale, this bone, it's missing here, but that rest of it is just very, very similar. Compared to Mosasaurus, which is another derived Mosasauri Mosasaur, uh, you can start seeing that humerus is is, uh, is different because it has that big projection uh, of the uh, corner, back corner here. And a red, uh, ulna, for example, uh, is also uh, different. And radius has really broad uh, uh, end here, whereas this end here is much narrower. And when you see the other mosasaur called Plotosaurus, it's even, the difference becomes even more clear. The humerus, it doesn't look like it. It's much shortened, and uh, none of other elements look very much like that of Prognathodon or Clydastis. Let's have a look at the hind flipper, which is a little better preserved than the fore flipper. Here again, this is Clydastis condition. Uh, it looks very much like the sketch of this uh, uh, Prognathodon flipper, but there are different uh, kinds of mosasaurins. But just you can see uh, this bone, for example, is just identical. The femur, your thigh bone, is elongate. 
and the space between those two um, um, bones is also elongate. And look at the, uh, this AS. This is called AS, astragalus. That is the ankle bone. How uh, similar these two bones are, having that J-shaped outline. Compare that to that of Mosasaurus. The femur is not as elongate. This uh, uh, foramen here is broader, and astragalus doesn't have that J shape. And on top of that, when you look at the finger bones, these are much shorter than these ones. And I must mention here, Cladastis has this elongate finger bones, like Prognathodon. Final bit, uh, Plotosaurus, once again the same thing. The uh, uh, thigh bone is shorter. Uh, nothing else looks very much similar to this. And then the finger bones, once again, is much blockier compared to uh, the one that I show with Pognathodon, which has very elongate finger bones. So what really does this mean, evolutionarily speaking? Well, first, the upper Campanian, 75 million years old, Prognathodon is, diff is a little different postcranially, so the skeleton, from 86 to 85, 80.5 million years old Clydastis. Uh, while skull architecture and dentition, okay, between the two are markedly different. I just mentioned, I forgot mentioning that the cladastis has this very uh, uniform dentition uh, from the tip of the snout to the back of the jaw. The dentition doesn't change as opposed to prognathodon that we looked at today. So the skulls are different, but not the skeleton. Therefore, in mosasaurian mosasaurs, okay, remember we are only talking about mosasaurians up to this point today. Radical modifications to feeding apparatuses, i.e. the skull and the dentition, the teeth, likely preceded those uh, modifications to the skeleton or, so to speak, the head evolved perhaps, perhaps first. And that means that this likely allowed mosasaurian mosasaurs to increase diversity in the Campanian and the later age Maastrichtian, which is the last stage of Cretaceous, as a result of increased guild or food preference diversity. So they reduce the uh, amount of competition. If I were to express that uh, in graphically, about 86 million years ago, we had Clydastis, which occupied this portion of that uh, guild structure. But starting in 80, uh, or starting after 80 million years ago or so, Prognathodon ventured into this region, and then Globidens, which had these bulbous teeth, they are true crushing dentition of, um, uh, within the Mosasaurus. They were eating on clams on the floor, of the, on the sea floor. So that's quite different. I mean, you can see even this is different even from the Prognathodon. And then towards the end of the Cretaceous, there's this something called Lyodon Mosasauroides that had highly compressed teeth laterally and this sharp uh, blade-like uh, cutting edges. They are like shark teeth. And probably that was an adaptation, further adaptation to slicing of, uh, uh, of uh, prey items. So um, I don't think they were feeding on clams. I don't think they were feeding very uh, actively on, uh, on the uh, ammonites, but rather they were feeding on something that are uh, uh, like a big fish uh, specialized in that regard. And uh, uh, so just, uh, I, uh, uh, just this January, uh, last month, which just passed, time flies fast, uh, there's a, a, a new Mosasaur, Mosasaurian Mosasaur reported from 68 million years, so that's a little younger than Prognathodon from Alberta, from Morocco, okay? And the name of this uh, taxon is Eremiasaurus heterodontus. Let's focus on that heterodontus part. Hetero means defer or varying. Dontus means teeth. In fact, if you look at the teeth of this thing, from the tip to the back of the jaw, you can see the tooth morphology changes. It's rather pokey at the front. It becomes flatter, uh, laterally flattened, and more triangular in the middle, and then, but straight, and it becomes recurved, curved posteriorly towards the back. So hence the name heterodontus. Now, when you look at the skull, yeah, it sure looks very different from either Clydestis, Globidens, or Prognathodon, or, uh, and, and so on. But when you look at the flipper, I can't really imagine anything else that is more closely, more, more similar to what we've got from Alberta. So this is Prognathodon flipper, that's Eremiasaurus flipper. I mean, 
astragalus, for example, this is even more similar uh, than clydastis, is to prognathodon. Uh, this bone called fibula have very broad ending like that. Long femur, unlike mosasaurus or protosaurus, as a mosasaurians, and this gap here, this, uh, uh, this uh, opening here, has that uh, very characteristic lenticular shape, like here. So, but in, so in fact, the fact that this mosasaur, Eremiosaurus, is 68 million years old makes that statement that from Chiodastis, which was about 86 million years old or so, the hind limb hardly changed in shape over 15 million years or even more, while their skulls are going enormous amount of morphological changes, evolution. To uh, conclude or sum, uh, to uh, uh, come to the conclusion from here, uh, this is my concluding slide, but uh, what happened actually after this time period, uh, about middle campaign, about 79, 80 million years ago, is that there's a decline in diversity of non-mosasaurian mosasaurs. For example, plioplaticarpines that I studied for my dissertation in, at the university, their peak diversity, diversity peaked in Santonian, when Clydastis was the only mosasaurian mosasaurs that's swimming in the Western Interior Seaway. Okay, but after Middle Campaign and onward, there's only one genus. This is a gene, those are all genera. The one genus, Pleopatocarpus, uh, uh, that is known, whereas Mosasaurian mosasaurs, including Prognathodon globidens, uh, Clydastis, Eremiasaurus, and so on, they started out very low in diversity, but then, just, like, uh, just as if they replaced the diversity of prior carpines, they started increasing the diversity, especially from Upper Campanian, where when, when Prognathodon uh, started appearing, appearing in the fossil record, and continued that diversity all the way to the very end of the Cretaceous. And one thing, one stalking uh, contrast that can be uh, made between these two groups of mosasaurs is that prior carpines have almost uniform shaped dentition. Whether you take the Santonian Salamosaurus, Ectenosaurus, or uh, Campanian Latoplaticarpus, or Maastrichtian Plioplaticarpus, the teeth look the same. On top of that, within the jaw of a given Plioplaticarpine mosasaur, the tooth is also the same. It doesn't change from the front end of the snout to the back end of the jaw. Whereas Mosasaurians, as I already showed you quite a bit today, I hope, they show uh, a greater and greater uh, modification and diversification of the tooth morphology that uh, I believe um, ens ensured their uh, healthy diversity so that they can feed on something different from each other that they, that, that, and, and reduce the uh, amount of uh, competition between mosasaur and mosasaurs and they could uh, eventually, because they could also venture into different food niches, food specializations, they could uh, outnumber uh, in diversity uh, the other mosasaur groups, such as plioplicarpines and so on. So that is really the take home message, and I hope I uh, touched a little bit on the evolutionary side of prognathodon, uh, although I didn't talk specifically about prognathodon evolution. However, uh, I thought this is a little more broad and uh, 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 more of more interest uh, for my audience. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, first of all, and also all those people who uh, were uh, involved, actively involved in the process of this work uh, done here at the museum. Uh, including Francois. Um, it's uh, not only he is the moderator of today's uh, speaker series, but also he, uh, brought, uh, he uh, let me use his uh, chemical analytical U tool. So I thank you for that. And uh, uh, funding sources and so on. So uh, with that, I, uh, uh, that is to conclude my talk today. And I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you.